hi everyone. It's um, great uh, to be here. Um, ben and I are, are very happy to share some of our experiences building the open experience and how including product thinking and product management practices into this process can yield a great result um, and build really delightful um, developer experiences. Um, thanks a lot to um, Ben and Adam as well for sharing from the previous talks and, and Mark for the great um, intros. Uh, I'm particularly interested in going back uh, and we'll see, you'll see why later to what some of uh, what Adam was just saying around going back to the problem to communicate the value and the why. And I'll try to go even more upstream and see how focusing on the problem helps you think, design, um, and deliver uh, great APIs. But before we jump in, a little bit of uh, intro on uh, who we are. Um, we are we're working at Onfido, a company founded in 2012. Um, we help businesses verify uh, that their users are who they say they are, whether they are a fintech or operating in the sharing economy uh, or, or a bunch of other verticals. We help them do that in a way that is um, remote, secure, and easy. Um, our vision is to um, create an, an open world where identity is the key to access and we can access all of these services, particularly this year, in an easy and secure way. Um, as such, we have our API, the very core of our product offering, as it underpins a lot of uh, sign up and verification processes for all of these relying parties and services. As part of this company, we uh, focus as a team on building a great product experience for our B2B clients that attracts, um, activates, allow them to integrate and engage clients end to end from the trial at the very beginning to the integration stage, all the way to long-term use, upsell, uh, and upgrades. And what I wanted to share with you today is, is really three main things. Um, the first one is APIs are a, a technical product, um, but I really want to invite everyone to look beyond the code and focus on the why and see how it can have downstream implications and positive effects. The second thing I want to share with you um, is that it's worth investing in discovering why users use your API, and that's good investment before you jump into delivery and building the product. And finally, with Ben, we want to see why execution matters and how with mission-driven teams, with end-to-end -end ownership, with um, agile delivery, we can build excellent um, developer experience. So let's start with the first point, beyond the code. So approaching from a product management perspective, talking to fellow product managers, talking to the larger uh, organization, when talking about developer experience and, and APIs, I can really see what people have in mind, and I can see it in their brain, it usually, they usually think about something like this. But that's where the problem starts, because it has multiple consequences. If you're a product manager working on a very technical product, there are two potential mistakes. One, you think, oh, it's called developer experience, and therefore it's probably an engineering thing, and I'll let the engineering team deal with it. Second potential mistake, you are a very technical product manager and you will go into the implementation, into the detail of the design and forget the reason why people care about your product. If you're coming from the engineering or tech writing um, side of the world, um, I guess the mistake would be not to involve an entire cross-functional team, various disciplines into the project. And if you can't do that, it would be not to adopt some product thinking in the way you approach, uh, you approach APIs and their experience. And I guess we wanted to share some of these principles uh, with you today. The first thing that we wanna share, and, and, and we have to say from the get-go, customers don't use your API because they like you. 
they use your API because it helps them solve a problem. And we spend a lot of time refining our product, refining our documentation, having a great automated pipeline, and we get attached to it. We fall in love with our solutions. But the truth is that customers don't care. They really care about how helpful you will be in solving a problem that they have. So in our world, we often talk about, oh, there is this payment API, and uh, there is this SMS API, and sorry for the time to, to Twilio, that, that, was, that was now. Um, and we have this new identity verification API that we're launching to the market. But really, that's industry talk. Customers don't really care about that. What they care about is, can I collect money easily and securely from my customers? What system should I use to complete a second factor verification? Or how can I verify that someone is who they say they are before they use my product? And that's really what customers care about. And if you help them do that, they will uh, like you and they will, be, they will pay for you. And so there's an another principle I'd like to share here is that APIs are not neutral conduits. They are designed and built to solve a particular problem. So knowing what people use your API for will inform how you design it and help you craft a delightful developer experience. Good APIs are flexible. They solve multiple types of problems, but they are also opinionated. They are optimized to solve the problem that most of your customers use them for. So that's quite theoretical. Um, so let's take an example. Imagine you have a large data set on rainfall volumes, right? So you have um, lots of data sitting there, and you are asked to build an API to monetize this. Great. One way to do it is to take your data, launch this new um, initiative, and you think, oh, we need to build an API. Let's talk to our engineering team and engineering leads. They probably have good opinions on this. They start building it, we start documenting it, and we're launching a, a great new API. It's very tempting to do this. Problem is people in this room probably know that this can lead to very, very, very bad effects. Instead, what I think we should do is, great, you have a new developer um, experience initiative. The first thing to do is pause and stop and build assumptions on why people would use this data. Write down these assumptions. If you have a user research team, try and work with them and validate those user needs. Try and really go deep and understand why people would use your product. And then from there, instead of starting building the whole thing, try and prototype it. We'll talk about it later, but there are tools that allow you to prototype things and document things and test them before you launch something for real. Prototype it, go back to your users, see if it helps them. Iterate on it before you really launch and track the results. So what does it mean for this Rainfall API? I mean, there are many ways to um, slice and dice information that you have. It could be by volume buckets, it could be by location, it could be by time increments. There are many ways to expose this type of data. If you design it in a vacuum, it's all going to be opinions against opinions. Some people will think that this is the best design. Some other people will think this other design is better to represent rainfall data. So this is why spending time and in going into proper research, going beyond the code, you might discover that people use your API and your data to solve very specific problems. They might be building an app that helps you decide whether you should bring your umbrella or not. It could be building a website that helps you decide where you should go on holidays next. Or it could be simply that people want to organize a barbecue this weekend, and they just want to know if it's going to rain. Um, and Or you are trying to buy a house. Um, and you want to um, see 
how much rain you would expect in a particular region. All of these are potential use cases of the same data, and they will inform how you design something. Because as I mentioned, good APIs are opinionated because they optimize for the majority of the people that use your API. So we've established this. APIs are not neutral. They're designed to build a particular problem. But the end of the sentence here is very important. We want to solve problem for customers in a way that supports the business, in a way that supports revenue, and in a way that supports the company strategy. So how do we decide on this? And again, that's where product thinking uh, kicks in. How do we know we are effective at supporting the business? One of the key tools we want to use here is make sure we define metrics. When it comes to APIs and Docker experience, it's very easy to stop at point one, health metrics. Uptime, um, SLA response time, bottlenecks, and so on and so on. How, but all it does it is about how performant and reliable our systems are. But I think we need to go beyond that. We need to look into growth metrics. How good are we at acquiring new users, activating them quickly, and retaining them? Are we creating a new growth funnel um, through the open experience and sandbox? And the third type, which is feature metrics. How effective are we at solving customer problems? So all of these need to support business objectives. So building a great documentation, building great guides, building great API design would, for example, here help reduce the time to integrate, reduce the number of support queries we receive, or, receive, uh, or reduce the time to upgrade to a new version. Those are business outcomes. These business outcomes lead to higher level business outcomes. If you're integrating fast with very few need for uh, support um, from our uh, support team, you will go live faster. If you are happy with us and it's easy for you to upgrade, we have higher chances of retaining you and re renewing you as a client. And all of this leading to happier clients, which means supporting the revenue uh, goals of our business. So this is where you can track from very low level technical metrics to business outcomes and all the way to the top, top level metrics for a given company. So another principle I'd like to share here is we've all worked in, in product and tech teams and we have competing objectives from the business. We have constant feature requests and we have an evolving technology that we need to make sure that uh, we pay our debt, attack debt for, and that we keep uh, healthy. Great DERP experience also comes from methodical prioritization. Picking, the, picking your battles, picking the things to invest in, in order to build great products. From here, I don't want to go too far. You have plenty of frameworks uh, that you could use. It doesn't matter, as long as the framework you pick and the conversation you have is evidence-based, is a shared exercise in the team, and is around common objectives that um, support the company strategy. The second point that we wanted to make in this talk is how important it is for you to invest in discovery before you jump into building um, the API and the documentation that goes with it. So you, you want to know uh, why you build things and make sure you de-risk as much as possible that you're on the right track before you jump into delivery. Here are a few principles. Make sure you know who interacts with your API, who benefits from the value of your API, what motivates them, what environments are they in when they use your products? What state of mind are they likely to be in as well? So get as closely as possible to the users to understand all of these. For example, on Fido, this has evolved very quickly. 
we used to work with a lot of um, primarily small and medium companies, startups, where with a, a tech first and tech driven approach, mostly in the UK. The developers in their team were very close to the rest of uh, the company and had very good contacts on the business. And as the company grew, we evolved towards large enterprise clients, towards partnerships, towards the larger EU market, US market, and in Asia. And all of this contributed to a, a bigger distance between developers building the integration and people benefiting from it. You need to understand that in order to empathize with your audience and build something and explain something that is um, relevant to them. You want to avoid tunnel vision. So you want to consider the whole, the holistic developer experience. You want to avoid individual heroes. You want to take people on a collective journey of discovery and building products. And finally, you want to avoid local optimization. You might be focusing on what part of the developer experience, but you will hit diminishing returns. So be, be smart uh, when you pick uh, which lever you want to pull in order to increase the um, satisfaction of clients. Think of developer experience as a layered, uh, as layered as an onion. Um, and I don't mean by that that um, you, you might cry sometimes working on it. Um, I mean by that that you have multiple components that are shaped in concentric circles. You have the very API, the, the API at the very core. You have the error messages. You have the reference. You have all the guides that um, uh, guide our, our clients to to integrate. And usually, it's very easy to move things and to change things at the edge. Those are the faster things to change but the biggest leverage is at the core. So you might hit diminishing return by refining, refining, refining your guides, but sometimes you just need to redesign your API from the very core. And so that's what I mean when I say avoid local optimization, be smart and pick the right part of this onion to focus on. And then finally, last point on this section, you want to make sure that you are not blinded by the fact that you are working on a technical product. Feasibility is only one of the three risks you want to reduce. Utility, are you solving our cl uh, your client's problem? Are you bringing value? And usability are equally important. And you want to make sure you de-risk as much as possible on these three fronts before you start building a full-on product. And finally, in this uh, process of de-risking, you need to embrace uh, one of API's inconvenient truth, which is the concept of backwards compatibility. A lot of this product thinking in the world is related to uh, web uh, applications or mobile applications where it's easy to change things and to experiment. Here, we want to embrace the concept of breaking changes. And we want to make sure that we de-risk and we discover things as early as possible because one th uh, once things are deployed and live and offered as an API, it's much harder for us to retire them. So we want to be very careful, use documentation, use mock servers, use prototyping as much as we can in order to de-risk something before it goes live. And I'm going to pass on to uh, Ben to give you a little bit of flavor on how we can execute on this and how teams work together in practice. So thank you, Min. I hope everyone can still hear me. I'll ask Min to confirm <laughs> that he can. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, we're gonna, uh, Min is going to kindly um, comply when I when I say next slide, please. Uh, so uh, you'll hear me say that a lot over the, over the coming few minutes. Um, but as Min said, and if you could please go to the first slide, Min. Um, I'd like to use my slot today to talk about our particular journey that we've been on as a company. And the hope is that some of the lessons that we've learned, some of the, uh, I guess, wisdom that we can offer will be applicable to different situations that you may find yourselves in now or in the future. 
So by way of starting, um, I just want to talk about how um, we, over the last two years or so, have gone from being, as Min mentioned, um, a uh, developer-led outfit, so to speak, in terms of our developer experience offering, in the sense that documentation was, whilst I would say well-maintained, it was maintained pretty much exclusively by uh, developers and by those in engineering. So we've moved to this situation now where we treat it more holistically, we treat it as part of of this product that we have and our team being the client acquisition experience team, this is an integral part of that. And this timeline that you're seeing on the screen at the moment is kind of just a rough idea highlighting some of those key stages which we've um, which we've encountered and, and things which we've implemented. Um, and um, some of these are the things which I'd like to touch upon today. So rather than, I guess, exhaustively describing um, our, our whole portal offering, so to speak, um, I really, um, because I think there's been some fantastic talks today from uh, from my namesake Ben Greenberg and from uh, from Adam on um, elements, uh, if you like, down that avenue. For us, uh, for today, I'd really like to focus just on the um, on the work side, on the process side, and talk about holistically how we've treated our developer experience and how not by holistic, I don't just mean um, externally and, and thinking about things from the customer's perspective, but also thinking about things uh, from a team management perspective. So Min, if you could uh, please go to the next slide. So um, the, uh, the key thing for us uh, is that we are a cross-functional team. Um, documentation is very much a visible part of, of our product. Uh, distribution of that is, is key. And um, I've listed some of the, the elements of distribution which, um, which kind of describe what I mean. So product marketing, sales enablement, change management, release notes. Um, I suppose really uh, product, manage, product marketing, sales enablement, those, uh, those two elements are pretty much self-explanatory for us. Change management, we operate as in a DOCSIS code house. So um, very much a case of um, conventional documentation management using uh, Git version control, um, using a static site generator. In our case, it's, it's now Gatsby um, and, um, and publishing documentation uh, using, in our case, GitLab CI. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that later on in the talk as well. Um, I think one thing which I've uh, I've encountered a lot when I've attended uh, conferences of this nature in the past is, and when I've spoken to other people in the community and had the good fortune to do so, I've, I've come across this idea of a technical, technical writer a lot. And um, I think, to be honest, I'm not, I've never been, really been quite sure what, what technical, technical means in, that, in this case. I think I do understand the sense, but I think I would say that we're all technical here. And um, what I, I would love to convey is this idea that there are these these things that um, anyone can become involved in, even if you don't necessarily consider yourself to be uh, on the technical side of of this of writing and our discipline. If you're um, if you're someone who just wants to dip their toe in it, nowadays there are so many excellent features which are almost off the shelf, which you can int integrate inside your developer experience. Um, and um, and one of those is actually uh, I'm going to touch upon in, in I think in the next slide. So Min, if you could. If you could kindly move to that. So, um, so developer experience sits within the CAE team for us, and um, this holistic API experience, uh, which Min's already talked about, is what I really want to drill down into. And for us, that means reference documentation. It means information architecture, and by that I mean beyond just the reference documentation. I mean uh, everything that we host for tooling, uh, so documentation on GitHub for our client libraries and. For us, a client library is, is what a lot of people would call an SDK, um, our Postman collection, and our open API specification. So all the documentation surrounding these, um, these kind of peripheral tools which facilitate developer experience, they need their own attention, they need their own care, and that's why I've kind of differentiated the documentation uh, to that end by referring to it as information architecture. But the second reason I've done that is because um, considering the overall information architecture and how all of this is presented and the navigability of these different elements is really vital. The last key element that I just want to touch upon today is process and feedback um, and how it works for us. So Min, if you could please go to the next slide. So this again is what I really want to focus on. So this idea that this holistic API experience isn't just about the, the customer's experience, it's also about how it can help you 
as, as an organization, whether you're in the private sector, public sector, charity sector, wherever, if you're working with APIs, this idea that you can segment these different elements of it and you can work in this, this kind of cross-functional environment. So Min, if you could please go to the next slide. So I think one really, really cool example of this for us, which I wanted to highlight, um, and um, I think Ben mentioned earlier this idea of using dashboards. We are one such company who does use a dashboard. And um, within that, we we expect our customers to generate API tokens to authenticate against our live um, IE production and our sandbox APIs. And um, this is something which, you know, this is just an example, but this is something which you almost take for granted. And for us as a team, uh, this element of the experience, we really focused on this. So we had designers really focusing on making this as positive an experience as we could. Um, and um, we had product management figuring out the best way to to work towards this goal. We had this this idea that we just wanted to make this as best an experience as we possibly could and thinking about that and how it fit into that overall experience. So this is one, one idea that I just want to convey as an example of that. And on the next slide, Min, please, there, there's another one. So we relatively recently transitioned from uh, our longstanding API version, API v2. Um, so as, uh, as has been said, we're an identi identity verification company. And um, so checks, uh, which consist of reports, are a very, very key, they're pretty much the integral part of our business. And the critical path when uh, using our API is to create an applicant followed by some supplementary steps followed by creating the check. And what you're seeing here is the old endpoint which was used um, to, to create a check inside API v2. And um, really, as you'll see on the next slide, if many you could kindly move to it, you'll see this juxtaposition where within our new API in v3, it's much simpler. And this, this visual impact, this um, this transition just neatly shows and encapsulates, I think, how we thought about everything to do with API v2 and all the difficulties that people had um, and things that they would trip up on, things like, for example, sending unnecessary JSON request keys, um, sending, um, in some cases, getting mixed up about which endpoints they needed to use. And, you know, we looked inside, for example, uh, our Splunk logs, we looked in to, to just tr to verify where people were, were tripping up um, and where um, invalid requests were coming from. And this that's just an example of, of the kind of thing which we tried to understand from a customer's perspective, uh, what we could improve. And this kind of, these this pair of slides just neatly encapsulates another example of the kind of thing which you can think about, which goes beyond just the developer side of things, but also just thinking about the overall experience side of things. Um, another part of that for us has been this idea of separating product and technical content. And this is something we've only relatively recently done. Um, so we've heard talk about, for example, API quick start guides. We've heard talk about uh, API references. Um, for us as a company, uh, when I came on board about two years ago, um, our API documentation was very much intertwined. And I think that's pretty typical of, of a company of our nature that's kind of gone from that startup position to more of a scale up position in the market. And um, so one really key thing which we identified we wanted to do was just separate these two strands. Um, I'm not going to drill too far down into this because I think I just want to um, illustrate the, the concept of this, the idea that product documentation, i.e. relating to what the product actually does rather than how you can actually use it, um, can help you to kind of think about different personas uh, naturally and intuitively um, in terms of how, you're, um, how you can manage your information. And this really comes back to this idea of information architecture. So Min, if you could please go to the next slide. So um, I've kind of touched upon the idea of intuition there. Um, so one thing which I personally um, have benefited from, and your mileage may vary from this, but um, from being uh, for quite some time, um, from having a relatively small team focused on this, um, we, I, 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 I've come across some, some situations where people think assumptions and intuition are, are bad things and, um, and how, really everything should be locked in in terms of concrete research. I don't disagree with that principle at all. Um, I think um, I think that, that comes from a very positive place, but I would say that um, there is a place for intuition. And I think in, in the position that we were in, we were able to benefit from this intuitive approach. And one such, um, I guess, neat idea I want to say is this idea that developers like to copy paste. And um, I think my most liked tweet of all time is, is where I said, uh, never underestimate the, uh, 
the um, proclivity of developers to um, to copy paste. And so, you know, that's a very rough uh, metric to to prove my point there. But I think the what I'm trying to say is that um, we we took assumptions like that, and we took assumptions, very broad assumptions, like the idea that having a simpler API experience would mean a simpler documentation suite, would mean simpler information architecture, and would mean everyone was happy. Um, and another example of this is where we've got, for example. This, we've got a migration guide uh, for going from V2 to V3 for existing customers. And um, one thing which we implemented here was just this hyperlink, which skips straight to the, uh, I guess, the meat of the matter. So some people are only going to be looking for that comprehensive table of endpoint mappings. And so this is just an idea of how even within these guides, you can kind of, you can cater for these different personas, but you can do so intuitively. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please, Min. So um, really, you know, just to kind of give you a, a broad um, look at, at our documentation, if you haven't seen it, so um, we we really run we really ran with this idea of the simpler API and having public documentation would would bring good things for us, and I would think broadly speaking, I would say that's absolutely true. This is our developer hub. Uh, the next slide is a snapshot of our um, API reference, which we've actually just recently implemented a new system for. So this. I mentioned is based on Gatsby. It's actually uh, it's a custom written system in house, um, which was all developed within the the developer experience team. Um, but it is based on on Gatsby, and um, and again this this system itself was uh, very much a cross functional effort. So we had designers involved in this, we had uh, technical writing involved in this, we had product management, we had obviously engineering involved in this. And um, this was very, very much a cross-functional effort. And I would say it's probably one of the, the happiest and most rewarding projects which I've personally worked on. Um, so Min, if you could please go to the next slide. Um, so this, uh, I've talked a little bit again, you know, about how our documentation is a little bit fragmented um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing um, as long as you can think carefully about how these things uh, navigate within your overall experience. And so uh, like many companies, we have an awful lot of documentation hosted on GitHub. Um, and um, publicly that is, and for us thinking about this, these are these are very much not secondary uh, considerations, but they are um, they are hosted separately to the on Fido.com domain. And Min, if you could please go to the next slide. The um, another point um, about just thinking about, um, I guess maybe backtracking slightly, talking about the separation of product and technical content. This, this slide you're seeing here um, won't mean anything to many of you, and that's that's absolutely fine. Um, but to our customers, this is this is gold dust, and this is something which we've we've had uh, said suggested to us by our customer-facing staff so many times that visualizing these things and uh, whereas previously we had this information all textual, now visualizing it, having this really visually striking piece of work which was designed in-house by a brand design team. Um, just to illustrate the product side of things and how our API breakdowns actually work and what they translate to in a meaningful sense. Going back to what Min was talking about, talking about you know what this actually means to customers, this can really help cater to not only those technical personas, um, and I, I use inverted commas when I say that, but also those personas who are perhaps um, on different parts of, of the business. So Min, if you could please go to the next slide. Um, and I, the last thing really that I want to kind of drill down to into uh, very briefly is this idea of, of process and, and what our process is. So repeatedly for us, uh, we in the past, we are graduating a little bit, but in the past we've made changes best on best assumptions or user research. Um, we deploy changes internally with this with CI CD, in our case it's GitLab CI. And for those of the for those in the company, and this is this is the I think the really interesting part of this process, which some some of you may find a, a useful takeaway in. Um, we we don't always have people contributing to this feedback process who are technical. Sometimes the people contributing to this are actually uh, not members of GitLab. They they're not capable of of responding to a Git diff, for example. So sending them this this deployed URL, which GitLab CI actually gives to us, um, sending them over Slack or email um, if they're not comfortable using that that mechanism, is really for us it's been transformative because even though they're not able to um, comment specifically on inline parts of of, um, of the page, they can nevertheless they can comment on a uh, deployment in situ, which almost exactly mirrors what something is going to look like when it's actually live on documentation.fido.com or developers.fido.com. 
gmail.com. And um, we can get feedback doing that from several places, whether it's email, Slack, or, or otherwise, sometimes even in person, in, in maybe in the future again, it will be. Um, and then um, we'll then use that feedback, we'll make more changes, and then we'll repeat the, the salient parts of that process. So Min, if you could go to the next slide, please. So in summary, really, I just want to emphasize this idea of, of treating the experience holistically and not just that the really key part of that is not just internally, but externally. Distribution is obviously key. Um, again, you know, this idea for me, everyone here, I think, is technical. I don't think there's a single one of us who aren't. Um, and for us, again, you know, a, a key thing really is the idea that assumptions aren't always bad. This was a lesson for us. I think this is your mileage again may vary. But for us, this this, I think, was a key part of our journey. Feedback obviously is vital. And um, I think I can safely say that Onfido is a really fantastic place um, for, for sharing and giving feedback. And I think that really, 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 in my experience, has helped enormously um, building out this, this holistic developer experience. And again, I just want to leave you with this idea that this simpler overall experience, or at least as simple as possible experience, will mean that everyone is, is happy within reason. So Min, if you could, please move to the final slide. I'll say thank you very much for listening and uh, we'll both be very happy to take any questions.